chapter 2 is our text this morning. Obviously, a Christmas message. I don't know on a Sunday morning, on the Sunday before Christmas, is if I've ever... Yes, I have. I preached on Galatians 4, 4, one Christmas morning, but for the most part, you have to be in Luke chapter 2. And uh, we will be looking at this text, applying it to our lives today. I hope that uh, you're glad to be with us. We are thrilled to see you. And, and obviously... The Sunday before Christmas is always a special day, and, and uh, it certainly is for me. Looking forward to tomorrow, 6 to 12 inches of snow should be great, and um, I'm hoping to get snowed in, and uh, so I have my own reasons for that. Don't ask my wife about it, but anyway, so why don't, you, why don't you stand with me, please, as we look at Luke chapter 2, and the Bible says, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in the manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Heavenly Father, I pray this morning as we look at this story that we will relive it once again, celebrate its truth, thank you for our Savior, and leave this place closer to you than when we came. Watch over our time, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Obviously, we want our events to be perfect. Family gatherings, weddings, funerals, even camping outings are planned. Needless to say, it doesn't always go well. Sometimes the, the tent leaks when you're camping. Sometimes uh, the bear gets into the grub, whatever it is that messes it up, flat tire on the trailer. We have all these things planned, and not, things don't always go as planned. And we have a young couple here, Mary and Joseph, that were supposed to be married. And uh, they found out that Mary was with, with child before they came together, but it was of the Holy Ghost. So I'm sure that Joseph was taken back by that. We don't have time to explore all of the ramifications of that this morning, but it was shocking to Joseph after the Lord revealed to him that it was, it was not of sin in Mary's life. It was a good thing. It was of the Holy Ghost. Joseph moved forward in the plans for Mary to have the baby, knowing that he was going to be the stepfather and play second fiddle to this baby all of his life. And so I'm sure that he, like any good dad, had started to make plans for that baby to come into the world only for the government to change things. And I don't know about you, but I don't, I, I, at times the government steps in in our lives through red tape or whatever, and the, there was a decree that went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And so to do that, the polling, the census, you had to go to your birthplace, which is not where they were, so they had to pick up and move, and Mary happened to be great with child, and this was not going according to plan, and I'm sure they weren't thrilled about that, but obviously being obedient, law-abiding citizens, they made the trip, and they wound up in Bethlehem, and they got to Bethlehem, and they did not call ahead. There wasn't the, the resources that there are today. There wasn't Expedia or any of the dot-com things that you could do. There was no place to call ahead and make reservations. They showed up. They got there. The place was packed. Everyone that was ever born there, ever thought of being there, was there, and there was no room for them in the inn. I can't imagine what it would be like when you, as a man, wanting to take care of your wife, knowing that she's in this situation, the selfishness involved, and we could ponder all that this morning, but the reality, you would think someone for a pregnant woman would care enough to give up their spot so she would have accommodations, but we find nothing like that taking place in our story this morning, because it did not take place. And the most gracious thing that was offered to them was a stable where they could at least have a roof over their head, and the Bible records that the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Obviously, that's a story that's not uh, new to you. Every one of us in this room have heard that before, and we relive it every Christmas time. And obviously, I am so thrilled this morning, I don't have to work my way to God. God came down to me. 
and that is the great difference in the faith of Christianity versus everyone else. Everyone else says you got to work, 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 be, 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 do, 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 and you hope through all of your effort that somehow you'll be pleasing enough to God so that you can get there, and there is nowhere in the Bible that teaches that. The Bible says, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. You cannot get to God. God knew that. And he came down to you in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. And I'm so glad he did. I'm sure Joseph and Mary had a plan and the government changed that plan. And in life you can expect the unexpected. You can expect the unexpected. Say that with me. You can expect the unexpected. And we've all experienced that before. There's a great verse in the Bible that if you've attended this church for any amount of time, you've heard me preach on in the past. It's 1 Corinthians 10.13. It says, There's no temptation taking you, no test that goes on in your life, but such as is common to man. All things are common. Say that with me. All things are common. Guy, there's no sin that you're struggling with that other men have not struggled with. It's common. Ladies, there's no situation that your husband is doing to you that other husbands have never done to their wives. Most things are common. There are some things that are uncommon, and that's God's interaction with man. That's uncommon. The love that God has shown to us in John 3, 16. The virgin birth is uncommon. It's one of a kind. God's miraculous work in our life can be uncommon. But the facts of man and the life that we live are all very common. And I want us to see the common things going on in the story this morning. Number one, one thing we all experience is death and taxes. Taxes. They're all going to be taxed. Taxes right now are in the front page of the news because the president just signed into law what they're calling is a $1.5 trillion tax cut. I don't care if you're Democrat or Republican or whatever, or what you see in that really doesn't matter to me. But taxes have always been in the news. They've always been there. Even when Jesus got older, he was affected by taxes at his birth, and he was tested by taxes when he was older because the Pharisees came to him, and those tempting him in Matthew chapter 22, verses 17 to 21, says this, Tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou? I'm always a little nervous when someone comes up to me that I don't know and says, I, I just want your opinion. And I'm wondering, really? Just why do you want my opinion? You know? and, and folks will say, you know, I've heard of you. And that always makes me nervous as well. So any of those things, they said, tell us, therefore, what thinkest thou in Matthew 22? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness. I like that. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. They brought it unto him, a penny. And he said unto them, Whose is the image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then saith he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the thing that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. So obviously taxes affected the life of Christ, and it was going on even back then. It was a controversial thing, and it's a controversial thing today. I, th I, wanted, I always like to put a little humor into my message, so if you go online and you just look up jokes about taxes, page after page after page after page after page, it was just too many of them. I couldn't find one any different than the other. It did talk about some of the most creative writing you've ever seen is on a tax return, and that's probably true. But all of those things take place, and obviously death and taxes affect us. Not only is there taxes with money, but life can be taxing, exacting, difficult, disturbing, regretful. It's not just the financial equation of taxes, but the taxing of life. And all about you, but I'm 55 years old now, and my body is being taxed. I feel it. I won't go into my aches and pains. <laughs> I've noticed, I went to put this shirt on today, and I can't button the top button anymore. I weigh the same amount. I'm, I know you guys are, now, yeah, Sherry Arnold's down here doing this. You know, real pastor's wife right there. I can feel the, the empathy that she has for me, you know. Tell Mark to find another job. Well, yeah, but anyway. So, but 
as you get older, I, w- I still weigh the same amount that I did. I've not gained weight, but your body starts to break down. Things start to sag, and your your neck just isn't the size that it used to be. You know, and that's it's called life. It's the taxing of life, and I'm thinking, I'm old, and I'm feeling it, and I just so. Oh, Mark, is he? Hi, Mark. Nice to see you. I thought you're not sitting over here with your wife. Yeah, yeah. I'll give you a good resume. Anyway, uh, so, but the reality of it is, is that I don't know about you, but there are times in life where you just think, this is hard. This is difficult. And for Mary and Joseph in Luke chapter 2, man, life wasn't going well. And I'm sorry for you this morning if life isn't going well for you. I, I'm sure there are folks here that have stories that are difficult. But I'll tell you what, God is faithful. There's no chance you're going through something that nobody else ever has, and he will make a way. Death and taxes, we can all relate to Mary and Joseph on that. There's the taxing, and not only that, there's the time. In Luke chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, the Bible says, And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea and the city of David. It's called Bethlehem. To be taxed with Mary as a spouse wife, being great with child. Really, what we've got here is a picture of time moving on. And so this happened. Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Now the tax bill comes due and they have to go and pay it. And really, there's nothing really unusual about this story. Events happen in life and time goes on. Every one of us are given 24 hours in the day. We're all given the same amount of time. Every one of us have to deal with it. And your cannot, time cannot be stopped. If you will, it's a conveyor belt in life that you are standing on, and it's moving, and it's moving, and there is no such thing as doing nothing. You know what? There's no such thing as doing nothing. You ask your kids, parents, you ever ask your kids, what are you doing? They say, nothing. It's not possible. If you're sitting on the couch, that's something. If you're breathing, that's something. There's no chance you're doing nothing. Time is marching on, and you're on the conveyor belt, and it's moving forward. And if you will, it's coming to the end at some point. We don't know where the end is, but the reality of it is, time is moving on. And you and I are all a part of that. And we do well to watch out. The Bible talks about in Ecclesiastes 3, it lists off all kinds of things that can happen in time. And said to say, Ecclesiastes 3, a lot of times, is a passage that we refer to at someone's funeral. And I've used it as an opener in many funerals that I have have been a part of. To everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. There's four more verses with more time, time, time. I always struggled with it as a Baptist. Time to mourn and a time to dance. So, dance, really? Is that in there? How could that be? You know, and I'm thinking, obviously, I, and, and, and so I'm thinking, it, it couldn't have said that in the original. Somewhere there's been a mistranslation there. But obviously, it's a time, there's times for celebration. There's times for dancing. David danced before the Lord when he was so thrilled for the Ark of the Covenant coming back and, and all of those things. And, but you wouldn't want to see me dance. You know, the dancing goes on, and my daughter's sitting there next to her mother. Don't do it, Daddy. Don't do it. So how many? I have one dance move. How many would like to see it? How many would not like to see it? Well, they want to see it. Uncle Pete doesn't want to see it. So, so yeah, because he's a griffin. He knows. There isn't any. There isn't. So, Emily, we were talking about this stuff the other day at home. This is our life at home. And, and so, Emily was so good at She could tell you the dance move of every person in our house. And I didn't even know we had any. Okay? But she can do it. You can ask her later. Here's my dance move. You ready? <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. All right? You know, you can go home and practice yourself. But the reality of it is, every one of us are taking up time. And for all of you now that are, are, that are here at church, you're just wishing, why did I choose this time to be here? But here you are. But every one of us are living something. And time is moving on. And it can be enjoyable or it can be tough. But obviously, we are all taxed. And we are all killing time. And I don't know about you, but as a pastor who preached the gospel, 
I want my life to count for Christ. And every one of us, you don't have to be a pastor to have that attitude. Make sure you're doing something. That when it's all said and done, your life mattered for the Lord. So we got taxes, time. Not only that, they're accumulating treasure. In verse number 6 and 7, And it was so that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. In Sunday school this morning, I asked uh, in the open exercises, what's the best gift you ever got for Christmas? And of course, we know the best gift, of course, is Jesus Christ. But in material things, you know, we've, I think you could all think about um, uh, Ken Mitchell came with us down to the nursing home. We talked about a bike he got one year for Christmas and stuff. And for me, at 13 years old, the first gun I ever got was a lever action 3840. And you know I'm a gun guy. This is my first gun. You could say, how could, how could that be? And this has got the smoothest action. And I just thought that was the, the nicest thing. And, and so for me, you can say, oh, that's ridiculous. But you know what? I probably wouldn't like what you got either. That's no problem, okay? <laughs> but, you know, you always remember things. And the reality of it is you and I are accumulating treasures through life. Now, it can be something as simple as a photograph that reminds you of something that's very special to you, or maybe, ladies, it's a dress that you wore whenever, or I can remember the first time I held hands with my wife. I know where we were. I know what part, where, where we, were, we were in the car, and I know I, we were on the corner of 14th and Union beside Grant's Dairy when Grant's Dairy was there. Okay, and if you're not from the area, you don't know where that is, and it doesn't matter. But there are times in life as we accumulate treasures, and we remember things. I can remember Phil was born 26 years ago, my firstborn son. And I looked in the, in the, the bassinet at the hospital, and I, I, I had no connection with that boy other than knowing that he was mine. I can remember whispering in the, the, in the nursery, I love you, son. You don't forget those things. There's treasures along the way, and every one of us have. You folks are sitting together. You've got family members that you're not normally in church with on Sunday, but you are today. I'll tell you, that's a treasure. That's something special. I've never seen Gary sing with his daughter before. I've never seen Gary move like that on stage before either, you know? <laughs> it, it must be Amanda. I don't know. But, you know, those are special times that we should not take for granted. But sometimes we do. There's time. There's treasures. Joseph and Mary never forgot the birth of their baby in a manger. Pivotal moments can draw you together or they can tear you apart. I've seen tragedy strike in certain homes and things, and it didn't help the family, it hurt the family. They weren't bonding times, they were crisis times. And that brings me to my last T. The taxes, the time, the treasures... And the tragedies. And verse number 7 says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. No room for them in the inn. Say that with me. No room for them in the inn. And obviously, there's a great song, No room, only a manger of hay. No room, for he is a stranger today. No room here in this world turned away. No room. No room. No room. The tragedy, I don't know about you, but <laughs> I've told you about my personal life, my dancing moves, all this. I've got one other personal story. Christmas creates a space problem in our house. Guys, if you build in a garage, whatever size you're pondering, it's not big enough, okay? It needs to be bigger. Everybody says to me, boy, Stan, you need a bigger garage. And I've always, I always want to build a bigger garage, but my concern is, in the, in the Bible, that guy that had it all, he says, oh, what will I do? I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger. And I think if I build a bigger garage, God will strike me dead. I don't dare, okay? But 
The reality of it is there's a space problem that goes on at Christmas time because we go and we get more stuff. And then what you have to do is you have to decide, okay, what other stuff now is no longer worthy because now we've got the new stuff and some of the old stuff needs to be displaced. And some of you, are you talking like this? Because you know we're all in this together. See, all problems are common, okay? So this is, this is how it is. And so I've got all this stuff and I have to decide in my life what it is that, that has to come and what gets to stay and what has to go. And, hon, I've decided you can stay, okay? But they're, they're you know, you gotta, you gotta consider it all, you know? So, but the, to me, so we'll get this stuff and some of it will come and some of it will go, whatever, and we move on. And, and, and some of these gifts are gifts that we know family members have given us and we think, okay, what happens if they find out that got demoted and, you know, all that stuff. This is, this is tough decisions. But I think the greatest tragedy really takes place in not recognizing the tragedy at the time. For instance, a great storyline in a lot of movies, like Hallmark, Hallmark movies are, are movies that women watch and men do on occasion, but they'd never admit to it, okay? So in the Hallmark movie... Usually, here, I'll paint a scene for you, is that it's a Christmas get-together, and, and they're coming, I'll be home for Christmas, and family members and, and old friends are coming back to that quaint little town that they grew up in, and, and in that process, there comes this encounter between a man and a woman who's roughly in their 40s. And they've had a life of their own, and they see so-and-so, and it was the girl, and he's the guy, and... Wow, how are you? Well, I'm fine. Gee, you look good. Well, thank you, so do you. How long has it been? Well, it's been quite a while. And there's this interaction going on, and you find out that it says, and he says, he says, I was going to call you. I wish you had. He says, I just never got around to it. She says, I was waiting by the phone. Have, we've, we've all seen these, haven't we? Don't look at me like this. We've all seen this stuff. And I'm looking at my wife while we're watching something like this and thinking, oh, this is awful. Like, I didn't see this coming, you know? And so they realize the tragedy is that they could have been together. They wanted each other, but they never told one another. And so now their lives have moved on, and all those years are gone. And it's awful. And you look at that, and you think, oh, it's so sad. And then you turn off the TV and go do something, you know? <laughs> but... <clears throat> In the space problem of our life, what happens is that in everybody's life, we have an encounter with Jesus Christ. See, God came down on Christmas Day and the birth of his son named Jesus that we sing to and we celebrate and we exchange gifts about. It's not so that we could have this great tradition worldwide, not just in America, that folks exchange gifts and celebrate a fat guy in a suit and all of the things that go on. It's not, that's not the point of it. The point of it was is that God made sure that he sent a Savior so that he could save his people from their sins. He was known as Emmanuel, God with us. And that baby grew up. And at about 30 years old, he started his public ministry. And he went out and he chose disciples. And he got 12 guys. One of them was evil. And he taught them what he knew. And then he laid down his life on a cross. And he gave his life. But the amazing part of it is, you and I can give our life. And many people do. Firemen, policemen, soldiers give their life. But there was something special about him giving his life because he gave it. And then he was able to take it up again. He came back to life, which you and I can't pull that off. We can give it, but we can't take it back. Jesus gave his life. Three days later, he rose again. And he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took our place. 
And somewhere in life, in time, in taxes, in tragedies, God exposes himself to us and he shows himself to us and we recognize who he is. But we have a space problem. And there's no room for him. And so we think, I'm going to do that one of these days. Wendell Calder preaches a great message, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Because most people are not denying Christ. A few people believe in Christ, but most people neglect Christ. Planning to later when they can find the room. And there's no room in the inn. And the reality of it is, many times there's no room in our hearts. And yeah, we believe in him. We intend to do something for him. Maybe someday we'll even choose him. But right now, i got to do this, this, and this. And really, your life is a bad Hallmark movie. That someday, the Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. But timing is everything. And there is no chance in hell today there are people that don't believe. They all believe. But they crossed the line and they, their life was over before they made their choice. And I just want you to know that God wants so much to have a place in your life, room in your heart. And it's up to you to make that room, to choose that room, the Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We don't put that off. And I think, if you'll allow me, someday there will be some of us that are here that never chose Christ. You're listening to me talk right now. Maybe you're hearing me over the Internet with this message is posted. Maybe in your car, wherever you listen to the messages. But it's possible you'll stand before God someday and you'll look at him, and you'll say, like in a bad Hallmark movie, you know, I always intended to call. I always intended to accept you. And he'll be looking at you and saying, I wish you had. But there's no time anymore. So you never made room. And now it's over. And there's a song that's written, you came one day too late. One day too late. Jesus came and you've been left behind to wait. And I'll tell you, the greatest tragedy that could ever take place isn't that you didn't call the girl or the guy didn't call you. It isn't that you wish you'd gotten something for Christmas that you never got. The greatest tragedy that will ever take place in all eternity is for you to neglect Jesus Christ until time is no more. Heavenly Father, I pray there's room. I pray there's room in our hearts for you. I hope that, I know that we're busy. I know that we're all given 24 hours. I know that everybody has family and life and boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, jobs, taxes, time, tragedies, turmoil. But Lord, the greatest thing we could do on Christmas Day is to make up our minds there is room in our heart for Jesus Christ. There is room in our heart for the baby. And that today, without waiting any longer, you'd say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart and be my Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around this morning, perhaps I've spoken to you. Perhaps you recognize that you've not made room for Christ in your life. And time is fleeting. The moments are passing. Why not this morning on the day before Christmas, December 24th, 2017, why not open your heart to Jesus Christ and stop putting it off and recognize that he wants you. He died for you. He rose again for you and he paid for your sins. Would you please ask him to be your savior?